We have talked about how the country is supposed to be run against according to the Constitution. We have talked about civil rights and civil liberties. Now is the time for us to talk, to bring it all together and see how it works in practice. And we are going to use the civil rights struggle as a case example of that, uh, showing you know, how the Constitution can be misused and then how people can use its provisions to correct that misuse. The civil rights movement essentially centered on a simple question. Does the law treat citizens as equals or does it discriminate based on categories that are not uh, legally accepted? The issue at the center were restrictions on the rights of people, specifically restrictions on the rights of African Americans. And at the center of this was a conflict that pitted on one side the executive and the legislative branch versus the judicial branch. Okay, And it took essentially work in uh, changing the views of citizens first, and then put press of, uh, pressure and forced the executive and the legislature to essentially follow the court's leadership on this issue. Let's start at the end. Where are we now as a result of the uh, civil rights movement? Uh, the courts, with their uh, jurisprudence, categorize restrictions on uh, citizens' rights on three categories. Suspect classification, which requires strict scrutiny from the court and is likely going to uh, end with the court declaring that restriction unconstitutional. Quasi-suspect. Uh, classifications, which requires intermediate standard of reviews, and then non-suspect uh, restrictions, which just need to pass a minimum rationality test, basically answering the idea, does this restriction apply to everybody, and does it for any reasons uh, overburden a specific group for characteristics that are very hard for that group to change? Okay, so the TSA uh, does put restrictions on our rights, forcing us to take a close off and everything. But the courts have pretty much decided that these are non-suspect because pretty much everybody who flies has to go through them. And uh, while uh, there are populations within the United States that might not be able to afford flying as much as others, they are not impacted by those decisions. Uh, and they're not necessarily distributed in a way that creates mutable characteristics. But how did we get there? Now, let us remember that one way to define politics, who gets what, when, where, and how, is to essentially define it as a process by which we decide that certain prejudices held by people are given the power of the law. Everybody is prejudiced. They are prejudiced uh, religiously, they're prejudiced socially, they're prejudiced educationally, they're prejudiced racially. Everybody, me, you, everybody included, has some kind of prejudice. A prejudice is nothing more than a negative feeling, negative view towards a person or a certain class of person that is not based on your own personal experience, but is based essentially on received wisdom based on past experiences of past generations, okay? Uh, in that sense, prejudices are irrational. They're not in reaction to something that has happened to you. But uh, they are very powerful because our brains work and use them as a way to simplify reality for us. So at the root of prejudice are uh, neurological, neuroscientific uh, factors, the way our brains work. And some prejudices we decide deserve the power of law. One example, for example, is that uh, in America, uh, you cannot uh, marry your dog or your pet or your cat. Uh, that is not legal. Uh, there's no real reason why you wouldn't be able to do it. The majority just dislikes it. Or we have all decided that murder is bad, that we shouldn't permit murder. There have been societies in the past, for example, the ancient Estonians, where you could kill a person uh, in a battle uh, and it will be considered uh, fine as long as it was a straight fight uh, and so on. So all our laws 
represent prejudices held by majorities, okay? And there are many prejudices held by majorities that we do not give legal sanction to. Uh, so that is politics. Now, racism is a system in which racial prejudices, so the specific racial prejudices of specific groups against other specific groups, are given the power of law. Racial prejudice is not the same thing as racism. Racial prejudice becomes racism when the government steps in to legal to make laws and enforce laws that essentially promote and agree with that racial prejudice. So taking the example of America, there are black people who are racially prejudiced against white people, yes, but that doesn't make America a racist country against white people. Why? Because black people never have held the power in the country, so they couldn't legalize their prejudices, provide them legal power. White people had the power. That is the sense in which the United States of America is racist, in the sense that certain racial prejudices were for a very long time provided cover uh, by the government and were you know, imposed by the government, a classical example will be the prohibition of interracial marriage, okay? There's no logical reason to prohibit interracial marriage, it's just because some people hate other people. And it's one thing for you as an individual to say, I don't want interracial marriage, I don't want my children to marry interracially, that doesn't make you a nice person, but that's just on you. And it's another thing to say, I want a law to prohibit that. That's the difference between prejudice and racism, between a way of thinking and a way of government acting. So you have to understand that difference. Now, racism in the United States is as old as the colonies, and that is the reality. Uh, before the United States Civil War, uh, many rights of African Americans and many non-whites, for example, indigenous Americans, Asian Americans, and so on, were severely curtailed. Free men, African Americans had few rights, slaves had none. Okay, I mean, the United States of America was partly founded by people who were racially prejudiced, and in order to uphold the system of slavery on which their economic prosperity was based, essentially used the state to impose that racial prejudice as the law, making it racist, unavoidably. It's not about whether you like it or not, that's just the facts. With the United Civil War, the United States Civil War, uh, slavery was made illegal in the United States. Now, that did not necessarily mean that racist policies were annulled, partly because a lot of the people who were in the North and fought for the Union were racially prejudiced themselves, and partly because at the end of the war there was the hope of just getting this over and with the freeing of the slaves that everything will then follow quickly. But what happened is Southern state governments immediately once the war finished, immediately started by passing the so-called Black Codes which were essentially racist laws that were put on purpose to restrict the ability of the newly enfranchised and free African Americans to participate in local state politics, to participate in federal politics, and to essentially be economically active. The North in reaction got angry and imposed reconstruction on the South, which was a massive social engineering project, which essentially had the goal of um, it's taking out the stem of racism from the South by giving power to the African Americans. Unfortunately, Reconstruction, due to the libertarian undercurrents of the United States of America and capitalist ideas of property rights, never crossed to the point of decisively altering economic relations in the South by making large-scale land redistribution. So African Americans got rights that had to be defended by United States soldiers, but they never got the economic power that would have permitted them to protect their rights against a resurgent race, racially prejudiced white majority or minority in some of the states. Now, the Reconstruction ended around 1878 because uh, mainstream whites in both parties decided to make an agreement uh, over the backs of African Americans during the Dilton Compromise in order to avoid civil war. Uh, 
the Democrats claimed the election uh, of the presidency was unfair. They threatened civil war. The Republicans made an agreement by which they will end reconstruction in return for the Democrats accepting the result. From 1870 to 1900, you had uh, essentially a lot of restrictions put on voting rights through poll taxes, literacy tests, all of these small laws called Jim Crow. So technically, you did not have official segregation. In 1900 to 1960, you have official segregation, a system of government where officially African Americans were segregated, forced to live separately from the whites. So you have to understand that before 1900, you had racism in the South and in many places in the North, but not necessarily segregation. Segregation, the classical Jim Crow, is a thing of the 20th century, following essentially the uh, strengthening of the South. So this is what the civil rights movement had to face. Now, segregation uh, was legal in the United States of America. Technically, it is still legal, and I'll explain what's the logic here. But uh, it was legal in the United States of America because it stood on a separate by equal clause, okay? When African Americans and their allies targeted initial, uh, seg initial uh, segregation uh, laws, they went after the separate clause saying that uh, mandating separate services for people based on their race uh, was illegal under the Constitution. This policy failed, and with Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, the Supreme Court said uh, that no, uh, separation is actually uh, completely legal under the Constitution, as long as the amenities provided to the two separate groups are equal. So it's separate but equal. Now, why did this happen? Well, a simple reason. Nothing in American culture said that people could not keep separate from each other and that separation was not seen as racism as long as they were treated equally. So the separate but equal clause, it was the equal part that protected the separate part. And thus, the initial attempts by African Americans to question those by going under, uh, after the separate clause so African Americans uh, tried other ways. They tried to use the federal government, but especially with the coming of Woodrow Wilson to the presidency and the establishment of segregation within the federal government. Before Woodrow Wilson became the president, uh, the federal government was actually not segregated. He segregated the federal government and the army. Uh, but you know, once that happened, they just could not find any help. State governments were also close to them. In the north, uh, they did not have the population. In the south, where they had the population, they didn't have the right to vote. And finally, the Supreme Court was simply unwilling to act on the separate clause, uh, keeping it standing. Uh, this led to the creation for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People by W.E.B. Dubois, who uh, used new tactics. Uh, the new tactics were to go to courts but instead of focusing on the separate part of the separate and equal clause, to focus on the equal clause and argue that the amenities offered were not equal. Also, another corollary to this was going to the streets, uh, agitating, protesting, and challenging those laws, trying to essentially create a situation where especially northern uh, state Americans and western state Americans, where there was no Jim Crow officially, would become uh, embarrassed uh, and uh, start putting pressure on their elected uh, officials to do something about it. One of the main leaders of the process of going to the streets was Martin Luther King, uh, who saw going to the streets as one of the main ways to show to America its ugly face. And here's a humorous clip from the Boondock series about that. You prank called Rosa Parks? She stole my thunder. Robert, you got to let it go. What did Rosa Parks do to you? Robert was a member of the Montgomery Bus Boycott Strategic Planning Committee in 1955. He was on that bus with Sister Rosa that fateful day. No. 
okay, this is it, brother. Remember, no matter what they do, nobody gives up their seat. You dig? We shall not be moved. Mm-hmm. Y'all can go head on to the back. We's moving, Mr. Boss, man. We's moving. Lord, I sure do wish these hippies could move faster for you, Mr. Move, Boss, boy. man. Have some roller skates on, I can get back there real quick. This here far enough no. for you, Mr. Boss, man. I can press myself up against the cold glass window. This good? It's you. Go ahead to the back. No. I am not going to move. Uh, 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 Mr. Bus Driver, sir? She, she, she ain't move. How dare you refuse to give up your seat, woman? What are you, some kind of history-making crusader for justice? Yes, we are. You think you're gonna change history on your own? Is that it, woman? All by yourself? That lady sure has courage. Hey, hey, what, what about me? I got courage. You want me to the hey, can someone get me the sheriff? Driver, I got a colored woman here who don't want to oh. give up her seat. Stay strong, She's Sister so Rosa. Brave. We love you forever. That's right. Take us to jail. We're not afraid. Stay out of trouble. Robert, you didn't. They laid her in state. They ain't gonna lay my black ass in state. They gonna lay me at the Johnson fucking mortuary down the damn street. Mm. Man. Mm. Hmm. <laughs> Now, the NAACP tactics were threefold. First of all, they focused on law school admissions. Why? Law school admissions, uh, first of all, were unlikely to create a very big backlash by Southern whites because it was already an elite institution that only affected a tiny minority of the population. And this tiny minority was also hyper-educated and more likely to respond to legal uh, arguments. Second, they were clearly discriminatory. Uh, African-American uh, students that went to law schools had to go to segregated law schools. Those law schools had worse libraries, worse professors uh, than the ones available to whites. And especially in the legal uh, uh, career where uh, networks are extremely important, the lack of good professors essentially meant a lack of good professional networks for those African-American lawyers down the way. So there was a case where it was, could be clearly shown that separate was not equal, that African-American lawyers had a worse educational opportunity than white lawyers in the same state. And third, this was something that Supreme Court justices, being lawyers themselves, judges themselves, could relate better to the issues at stake and understand it. And it worked. The court said that equals means equal. That if you are going to keep people segregated, you have to provide them equal amenities. Here's the problem. The southern states could never do that. They didn't want to do it because they were actually prejudiced. But even if they wanted to do it, they couldn't do it because a lot of the economic affluence and higher services available to whites were the result of denying the same level of service to blacks. If they had to provide equal, it will mean that they would have to degrade uh, the services available to whites. So. The court, the NSAP and NAACP and other African-American activists saw that focusing on education issues worked, okay? At the same time, the return of African-American veterans from World War II uh, changed the dynamics of the movement uh, when it came to the streets. These men had fo and women had participated in World War II against forces that were built on racism, Nazi Germany, uh, Imperial Japan. Uh, they had bled, they had fought, they had sacrificed time of their life for the country, and they had no intention of coming back to the United States of America and be treated worse than they sometimes were treated by their officially racist German or Japanese enemies. They were not willing to accept Jim Crow and they were willing to fight for it. And that leads to the civil rights movement. Third, Japanese internment during World War II, a clear case of racist policy justified by war. Notice how war and violations of the Constitution that are then upheld by the courts go together. 
look back to our discussion of freedom of speech, uh, had led to the court later on uh, articulate strict rules for accepting restrictions on rights because even though the court had accepted that violation during the war, after the war, they declared it unconstitutional. Okay. And under the new jurisprudence, the court was very serious about uh, issues of, uh, of restriction and discrimination against citizens. This is an excellent cartoon that encapsulates that attitude of African-American veterans who are coming back from a war against Nazi Germany, where sometimes they were treated better by the locals and the Nazis than they were treated by their fellow white soldiers coming back to the South and being treated like second-class citizens. As the boy says, my daddy said they didn't seem to mind serving him on the anti of Big Head, but I guess they wasn't getting along so good with them Nazis then. So that's an excellent explanation of this idea. All of this uh, accumulated to and culminated to the Brown versus Board of Education decision of the uh, Supreme Court, uh, where the court essentially declared uh, separate segregation uh, illegal if the amenities were not uh, provided equal. And the court started laying pressure on the legislators uh, in validating uh, laws that they had passed. Well, the civil rights movement started affecting voters. Now, the movement targeted two kinds of discrimination, de jure discrimination, which is racism, and de facto discrimination, which was essentially not done by the state, but by society, which is racially pre racial prejudice. Things like people refusing to give loans to African-Americans, things like people refusing to rent houses to African-Americans. As you can probably guess, going after de jure racism was much easier than going after de facto, again, because of the underlying libertarian ethos of the United States of America, which says nothing against somebody hating your guts and refusing to provide you with service. The successes of the civil rights movement in education, of course, created a backlash by white racially prejudiced majorities that wanted to uphold the racist system. This created uh, violence, uh, just like they had done uh, after the Civil War. They turned to violence, they recreated the, the Ku Klux Klan, they started killing African Americans, calling them lynchings and so on. And African Americans had a problem because how exactly were they going to get change and legal protection against this uh, community level violence against them uh, if they couldn't vote? Because remember, the law, the, the, the court's laws only affected educational policy until this point. It hasn't affected the right to vote where the South still discriminated. Well, when you cannot vote and you need to protect your rights, you have only one option. And when you know you have the executive blocked, the states blocked, the legislative blocked, the, the, the court systems blocked, you go to the people. You motivate the people you want. You take a mirror and you show them the ugliness of the system, which they have either been tolerating or uh, ignoring. So the goal of the civil rights movement was to get progressive whites and Northern African Americans that had the right to vote to change the attitude of the federal government. So then the federal government, in conjunction with the courts, would force southern state governments to change their laws and restore voting rights. That was the strategy. And as this uh, short documentary clip from BBC shows, it was a hard fight. It was a hard fight. In many ways, you wanted to get Southern police forces to be nasty and brutal to you because you wanted that on camera because that showed to people in the North, like, look, you fought the Civil War, you won it, and then you just let these people continue doing the same kind of stuff they did after the Civil War and during the Civil War. And it worked, because when you had the Cold War, where the United States of America was presenting itself as the paragon of democracy and equality, you have these pictures coming out, you undermine the United States' ability and myth to sell itself as the leader of the free world. So, voting changed. Some of the good people of both races who live under the protection 
of the United States may not be satisfied with the decision of the Supreme Court. The law is there to uphold the human principle, that there is equal justice because we feel it in our hearts, that this is the law of our hearts. And I think all of us now are very sober in realizing that unless we integrate, we shall very quickly disintegrate. Now, therefore, I, George C. Wallace, as governor of the state of Alabama, do hereby denounce and forbid this illegal and unwarranted action by the central government. The president of the United States and the attorney general have encouraged demonstrations. General Lamb and this person. To be given the rights of a human being? I think you're not going to ever eat here. Now, do you want to close the business? Is that what you want to do? You can't eat here. If an American, because his skin is dark, cannot eat lunch in a restaurant open to the public, if he cannot vote for the public officials who represent him, if, in short, he cannot enjoy the full and free life which all of us want, then who among us would be content to have the color of his skin changed and stand in his place? Put it on TV! Put it on TV! I want the world to see this! We will march in Washington on August 28, 1963, along with hundreds of thousands of our fellow Americans who believe in equal opportunity and freedom for us all. Now, we don't have any Rockefellers in our midst. We don't have any Henry Fords. But we do have a king. We've got Martin Luther King. And I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And it has to be said that beyond the activities of the African-American civil rights movement, beyond the voting power of the North and the Western states, you also had the fact that in some places in the South, in some states of the South, African-Americans already had the right to vote because they had used economic leverage which for change. So, for example, in the city of Atlanta in Georgia, African-Americans had actually been able to protect the right to vote from 1946. So, all of this together led to the civil, right bill, civil rights bill of 1964 under the Kennedy administration that outlawed segregation, then the Voting Rights Act of 1965 by Johnson, which essentially restored the right to vote to African Americans. Southern African Americans now have the right to vote, and guess what? Guess what? Guess, guess what? Southern governments start being responsive and changing their policies. Indeed, in many cases, the same racist governors of southern states that had opposed the right of African Americans to vote, that had, you know, tried to defend segregation and education, the moment African Americans got the right to vote, the next day, they were the first to appoint African Americans to important positions of power and government in the state governments. Voting works. The civil rights movement shows it. But it doesn't work on everything. You see, it worked greatly on dismantling de jure discrimination, racism as a political system, but it failed completely against de facto discrimination because it's harder to fight. Because first of all, it existed in both North and South. Northern whites were racially prejudiced, uh, Southern whites, Chicago whites were racially prejudiced, New York whites were racially prejudiced. They just didn't express it by racist laws. They expressed it by de facto discrimination, by social censure, by social restrictions, by invisible chains put on African Americans. And because of the fact that this existed both in North and South, it was hard to create a coalition against it. Secondly, it didn't target as clear as right as voting. Voting is a very clear right. Everybody understands this. But the right to good housing, is that a right? Is that a constitutional right? The right to employment, is that a constitutional right? And so on. Third, the movement against it became far more violent with the Black Panthers engaging in terrorist uh, violence and a lot of race riots happening, especially in northern cities, to the point where southern racists then will hold their nose and say, like, see, it's northerners, we told you about it. And fourth, as I pointed, again, at a very basic level, Americans are not sure that states will have so much power over private life. 
It's that basic libertarianism that underpins American politics. Dealing with the fact of discrimination has always been much more controversial in America because by necessity it's not about procedural uh, procedural processes but it's about justice of outcomes and as I pointed out Americans generally do not agree about the importance of procedural guarantees versus substantive guarantees an attempt was used to use busing to get African American students to more affluent schools in white neighborhoods and to get white students to more poor schools in African American neighborhoods so as to for societies to increase funding, it completely failed. Uh, and another attempt was affirmative action. And affirmative action is very misunderstood in America. Affirmative action in America is not a quota system because a quota system will be constitutionally illegal. You have quota systems in places like India, where there is, for example, a law that says X amount of X percent of your workers or X percent the members of parliament have to be women or have to be from the untouchable caste. Essentially, historically, groups that have been marginalized in Indian history. That will be illegal in the United States of America. Instead, all that affirmative action says is that race can be one of the many considerations, including education, job experience, and so on, and so on, and so on, for hiring somebody to a job or for accepting somebody to an educational system. So. Affirmative action is not a quota system. Understand it. Now, are there administrators and employers that use it as a quota system? Yes. But they're not mandated by the law to do it. That is their own free choice. That's about it. That's where we are right now. Legally speaking, de jure racism is dead in America. Uh, but de facto racial prejudice is alive. And when we're going to talk a bit about the judiciary, we are going to talk about the potentiality of the jury racism existing in a way within the criminal court system. But that's the discussion. This is an example of how politics works, okay? How you bring all those elements we talk together to bring about change when it came to the question of civil rights and civil liberties. Next course, we will start looking more specifically into the three branches of government and how they operate. Now, we covered a lot about the federal government and its conflict with the southern states, but civil rights violations didn't just happen in the southern states. And Nevada actually is a good example of the type of violations you will see in many other states that never really implemented Jim Crow per se, but still had a lot of de facto discrimination. Nevada used to be called the Mississippi of the West. It was that bad. On the right to vote until 1877, only white, in quotation marks, men had the de jure right to vote. In 1914, women got the right to vote. Other racial and linguistic minorities had to wait for federal civil rights legislation for getting the de facto right to vote. Indeed, Nevada had a poll tax from 1910 to 1966, Article 2, Section 7 of the Nevada Constitution. And all this, despite the fact that Nevada voted for the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, whose goals were to abolish a lot of racial discrimination and guarantee the right to vote to everybody. That said, Nevada has some differences in the situation in other states. In the 19th and 20th century, the main targets of racist legislation and de facto discrimination were the indigenous Americans and Chinese immigrants. For example, after statehood, African Americans had the right to testify in court, but indigenous Americans or Chinese immigrants did not. This changed for the Chinese in 1881, but was largely ignored by all white juries. There were miscegenation laws prohibiting marriage between people of different groups in effect until 1959. Indigenous Americans were forced into reservations between 1875 and 1877 and were legally discriminated in manners of commerce, education, property, access to public services and access to employment. They were also the targets of violence. Things got better in the 1920s and 1940s. The decisive turn was 1965 when the Nevada legislature created an Indian Affairs Commission. More important was the 1946 U.S. government, federal government's Indian Claims Commission, which began a process of restitution for injustices and treaty violations during, done during U.S. expansion on the North American continent. 
Chinese immigrants seeking work in mining or the railroad also face restrictions on employment, property, and ownership, and were the targets of violence, for example, the Renault 1908 racial pogrom against the Chinese there. Things got better for them and all Asian Americans after 1959 and with the enactment of the federal civil rights legislation of the 1960s, 1970s. When it comes to African Americans, in the 19th century there were too few to matter and faced mainly de facto discrimination beyond the de jure racist discrimination that indigenous Americans and Chinese immigrants also faced. So they were not specifically targeted as targets of a Jim Crow style legislation. They just were covered by the general hatred of the white majority for any racial uh, minority group. The fact of discrimination specifically against African Americans intensified after the 1930s and 1950s when African Americans moved into the state to work in federal projects and then the casino industry. This uh, discrimination also covered Hispanic Americans, which initially were mostly Mexicans, but after also Cubans. Civil rights movement took place in Las Vegas, the NSSAP had activity under Dr. James McMillan, and local government tried to make changes, but change came under pressure from US federal government activity. 1965, there was a state civil rights bill. In 1971, Las Vegas businesses promised to stop discrimination. In 1971, there was a state law making housing discrimination illegal. These laws and changes also covered Hispanic Americans. However, uh, women, on the other hand, did not see an end to job discrimination in Las Vegas until 1981. And Nevada only ratified the Equal Rights Amendment in 2017. When it comes to sexual minorities, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender groups, they also faced a jury discrimination. There was a sodomy law targeting them that existed until 1993. Between the 1990s and 2017, you have the passage of multiple laws outlawing discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity. On the other hand, there was a prohibition of same-sex marriage from 2000 to 2017, even though in 2009, the state did permit domestic partnerships.